Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Arcadia Valley, in Crawford County, in Kansas, many people reported seeing a wild man or a gorilla in the bottomlands of the Osage River. It was called Old Chef by the locals and was seen by over 60 people. Old Chef had a stooping gait, very long arms, and immense hands, and was covered in hair. It walked on its hind legs, but occasionally ran on all fours. As for hairy men of unknown type, these were reported from lots of places over the years. This was a first sighting for Kansas in 1969, but there had been a few sightings in Arkansas before. There were over 60 sightings in this period. On Sunday, August 15, 1869, Correspondence of the St. Louis Democrat by M. S. Trimble, Journal of Free Press, Osage County, Kansas. We of the Arcadia Valley in the southern part of Crawford County are having a new sensation which may lead to some new disclosures in natural history, if investigated as it should be. It is nothing less than the discovery of a wild man or a gorilla, or what is it? It has, at different times, been seen by almost every inhabitant of the valley, and it occasionally has been seen in the adjoining county of Missouri, but it seems to make its home in the vicinity. Several times it has approached the cabins of the settlers, much to the terror of the women and children, especially if the men happen to be absent working in the fields. In one instance, it approached the house of one of our old citizens, but was driven away with clubs by one of the men. It has so near a resemblance to a human form that the men are unwilling to shoot it. It is difficult to give description of this wild man or animal. It has a stooping gait, very long arms with immense hands or claws, generally walks on its hind legs, but sometimes on all fours, the beast, or what it is, is as cowardly as it is ugly, and it is next to impossible to get near enough to obtain a good view of it. The settlers, not knowing what to call it, have christened it Old Chef. Since its appearance, our fences are often found down, allowing the stock free range in our cornfield. I suppose Old Chef is only following his inclination as it may be easier for him to pull down than to climb over. However, as it is, curses loud and deep are heaped upon its head by the settlers. The settlers are divided in opinion as to whether it belongs to the human family or not. Probably it will be found to be a large orangutan that has escaped from some menagerie in the settlement east of here. At one time, over 60 of the citizens turned out to hunt it down, but it escaped, probably owing to the fright that it received, it kept out of sight for several days. And just as the settlers were congratulating themselves that they were rid of an intolerable nuisance, Old Chef came back again, seemingly as savage as ever. If this meets the eye of any showman who has lost one of his collection of beasts, he may know where to find it. At present, it is the terror of all women and children in the valley. It cannot be caught, and nobody is willing to shoot it. M.F. Trimble On to the next one. Sunday, September 5th, 1886. The New York Times. Harry Wild family seen and captured. Washington County. For several days, people were seeing what they called a wild family, which consisted of a man, woman, a girl, and a child that are covered with black hair. Such parties captured the entire family. They do not talk. 
and the woman make a grunting and groaning sound. Doctors think that the family may have been scalped and went insane due to the fact that the man and women are missing hair from top of their heads. Doctors have hoped of restoring their sanity. On to the next one. On November 1903, miners on the night shift in Eloa, Allen County, Kansas, saw a man-like creature covered with hair. The creature had great big red eyes and that had an inhuman look to them. The human stood erect like a man. The appearance of the humanoid caused a panic amongst the mine workers. On to the next one. Tuesday, July 21st, 1964. Topeka Daily Capital, Topeka, Kansas. Hairy, gorilla-like creature seen. A man, bread delivery driver, reported to police at St. Mary's that at 5 a.m. Monday, by railroad tracks at the southeast edge of Delia, that he saw something around five feet tall, extremely hairy on the track. He stopped his truck, and it ran off into the weed. It walked in the position of a gorilla. Later, the sheriff and game protector could find no sign of it. Later, a farmer said that something had killed 16 of his 18 50-pound hogs by biting them in the neck. On to the next one. In Delphos, in Kansas, in the third week of July, 30 miles northwest of Selena, there was a wolf girl seen, or a humanoid being covered in hair that was the size of a 10-year-old girl. The humanoid had light-colored matted hair and wore filthy and tattered red clothing and ran on all fours extremely fast. Many witnesses had seen Wolfie eating from pet dishes and stated that she lived in a brushy, vine-covered area at the northwestern edge of town. A man and a boy claimed to have been attacked by the creature by being jumped on and scratched by it there. On to the next one. This was in Coffee County in Texas. My husband and two sons and I lived in Emporia. Through our church, my husband had become involved with the scout program. They were having a weekend camp out an award ceremony maybe 50 miles east of Emporia. He called at about 10 p.m. saying he had forgotten the award and asked me to bring them to him. I left at about 10.40 and went east out of Emporium, I think, on Highway US 50. Shortly after passing what I believe was called Beto Junction, I turned south and curved around to the east as it was supposed to be the shortest route. The road had no shoulder and was filled with potholes, forcing me to go at a very slow rate of speed, no more than 30 miles per hour, and slowing further than 30 at times. I had gone only a few miles when I saw movement to my right side about 50 feet ahead. Thinking it was a deer, I slowed to almost a crawl, partly due to the road conditions as well. What I saw was not a deer, but something walking quickly in an upright position to the fence. The creature just lifted the right leg it was facing me and stepped over the barbed wire, took a couple of steps, and was in the road. I came to a complete stop, being only 20 feet away from the creature. It stood in the middle of the road with my lights on it. It looked at the car, and I looked at it. I opened my door and stepped out, keeping the door in front of me, and we looked at one another for what seems like a full minute. Visually, the creature was maybe seven feet, hair covering the body, not being short like fur, but generally two to three inches on most of the body. There was hair covering the chest, but the area was more sparse. It seemed to be uniformly proportionate, with the arms being the only exception and that was minor. The one other thing visually, the eyes appeared to be red and almost glowed red on their own, 
and not as reflected might produce. I remember an odor, musky, wild, best describes it, but nothing I had smelled before. The other thing that struck me was a feeling of calm and not fear. I distinctly have remembered I should have felt threatened, but there was no feeling of being in any danger. Just as though we were both curious, the creature began to move, and I got into my car as he continued across the road with just a couple of steps, went down into a narrow ditch, and then stepped up and over the fence on the north side so easily. It continued for a few steps, stopped and looked at me again, and then strode with a long stride toward the trees. I sat there for a couple of minutes and did not see this creature again. I had my two preschool sons with me asleep in the back seat. The time was approximately midnight. The weather was chilly and the night was clear with maybe a half to a quarter moon. There was pasture or field on both sides of the road with groves of trees or thick hedgerows approximately 75 to 100 yards behind on both sides of the road. On to the next one. In Neosho County in Kansas, although I nor my boys have actually seen a Bigfoot, they have seen strong evidence of one. My son and his friend found large tracks in fresh snow south of Galesburg, Kansas. They followed these tracks for about half a mile until they stopped under an old railroad trestle. Sometime later, they were checking limb lines about 12.30 a.m. in their boat in the same area. The night was very dark, and although they had a flashlight, all it would reveal was the immediate brush along the creek. As they paddled along, they kept hearing something in the brush, which they assumed was a deer. A few minutes later, a huge rock came flying downward in front of their boat and hit the water. Whatever it was had to be either human or a human type of creature. It is unlikely to have been a person since that side of the creek is avoided because of its inaccessibility and very heavy brush. Just north of the incident, tracks were found the previous winter. The two witnesses were my son and his friend. They were paddling a rowboat to check limb lines. It was approximately 12.30 a.m., chilly but not cold. The area is brushy woods along a muddy creek. Important, the west side of the creek is inaccessible by car, but parking the car along the road, one can walk south into the woods. On to the next one. Five people, said to be from Fort St. John, British Columbia, came upon a set of huge footprints while fishing on Bull Moose Creek, 40 or 50 miles southeast of Chetwind, British Columbia, about a mile from the nearest road. The prints appeared to be about a week old. There were a half dozen of them going from the creek across sandy soil to a rocky brush area. Length was about 17 inches, width 10 inches, space between the tracks about 6 feet. A week later, a group went back and a trapper named Norman McKenzie made three casts. Depth of the cast is given as 3 to 4 inches, but a biologist who measured the remaining tracks said they were one and one-third inches deep. The tracks have four enormous toes, as big as the heel of a human. To judge by one of the photographs, the heels are almost as wide as the front of the foot, making the overall shape almost rectangular. On to the next one. In Upper Fraser, I was at the time working in a logging camp in the central interior of British Columbia, approximately 50 miles east of Prince George. The terrain is hilly and mountainous. The prominent tree species are fir, balsam, and spruce. The road I was traveling on was adjacent to the CN Railway, 
which in turn was adjacent to the Fraser River. I was traveling in a northwest direction at approximately 6 p.m. I was riding my motorbike that had an extremely loud exhaust system. I was approximately two kilometers from the logging town of Upper Fraser. As I came around a corner, I noticed something in the ditch on the left-hand side of the road. There is a rock canyon at this location. The animal in the ditch was dark brown in color, and at first I thought it to be a black bear. As I got closer, it came out of the ditch walking like a human. It was totally covered in hair its height better than six feet. It turned its head to look at me and continued to cross the road. It then disappeared into the bush on the right-hand side of the road. It is mixed mountainous forest with lakes and rivers nearby. On to the next one. I was traveling by night from British Columbia to Alberta. I'm not sure whether we were in BC or Alberta when this happened, but I think we were probably still in BC. I was with my sister and another friend. We decided we were too tired to drive and that we would pull over and get some sleep. We were in a little beetle Volkswagen. We pulled our sleeping bags over our heads because we were near the road and the headlights of the cars going by bothered us. Before I fell asleep, I heard a thump on the roof of the car. I thought it was just the car settling, cooling down, things like that. But then I decided to look out and make sure. When I looked up, I saw a hairy, man-like thing running across the road, being illuminated by a car that was approaching. We decided to not stay there and instead go to a truck stop to sleep. Nighttime weather conditions were fine. Cars driving by were illuminating the road. We were at the side of the road near a forested area. On to the next one. At Dunn Lake near Barrie in British Columbia in Canada, Tim Messiner, who was 16, was fishing with friends when he saw Bigfoot across the lake. They had at first heard a loud screech and saw the creature with its arms raised. The creature ran off into the woods and the youth went over to investigate. They found a deer with a broken neck hidden in underbrush and moss. Messner and four others returned to the site on the 30th of April and separated to search the area. Messner saw the Bigfoot again. It was nine feet tall, black, and hairy with a human-like face, with great, big, glaring bright eyes, as well as shoulders four feet across. The creature glared at Tim for three seconds, at least, and was only fifty feet away, and Tim could smell it. Tim then shot at the Bigfoot, though he was really scared. Tim had aimed for right between the eyes, and the creature went down on one knee and one hand, but then rose up and ran away at 30 miles per hour. On to the next one. At Patricia Bay in British Columbia in Canada, on two consecutive nights, a witness watched a large white light come from the north and hover briefly over the sea before leaving. The morning after the second night, a First Nation man living nearby was awoken by his dog barking furiously. Looking out, he saw an enormous gorilla-like creature climbing out of the sea. The creature climbed up the bank through the trees, then ran at a very high speed down the road, quickly disappearing from sight. On to the next one. On the Susqua River, about four kilometers above the mouth where it enters the Bulkley River. This is about 12 kilometers from Hazleton in northern British Columbia. Before going to bed this particular night, my wife and I couldn't find our dog anywhere. He had been barking at night the past few evenings, mostly just over the little ridge. 
About midnight, my wife got up to go to the outhouse a short way from the back door. She didn't take a flashlight because it's so close to the house. It was very foggy out, and on the path, she heard something move right next to her, and she smelled something very bad. She said she could have touched it. It was so close. It started to move away, and she ran back in the house and jumped in bed, half screaming. She was too scared to scream out loud, and that scared me. It made the hair on my neck tingle. I got up and got my gun and a flashlight and went outside, but with the thick fog, I couldn't see anything. I heard it walking, though, and I smelled it. It sounded like it was walking on two feet. I went toward my dad's place about a quarter of a mile away and could hear it making noise like a low screeching. I went back in the house and was pretty scared. The next morning, I went out to look for signs, but I couldn't see any tracks. It had stepped over a barbed wire fence and broke it. The nails were pulled out of the fence post. I couldn't find any hair on the fence. Later that day, Dad told me that he went to go to the outhouse late last night and started to open the door on his little trailer, and something was holding it from opening. He got scared, thinking it might be a grizzly, and he didn't have a gun, so he got his hammer. That's all he had, and whatever it was, holding the door went away. He said he didn't go out to the outhouse. Bob Titmuth used to live about eight kilometers from us. He came over to my wife's folks quite often and visited. All he talked about was Bigfoot. He moved away before this happened. We found our dog down at my wife's folks' place the next day, about four kilometers away. Pat Baker used to live in the same area, and he saw a track at one time that he thought might have been a Bigfoot. Even today, when I think about that night, the hair on the back of my head just bristles. It was pretty scary. The area is heavily forested with a lot of undergrowth and is relatively flat with a few small ridges. It is about 1,200 feet above sea level. On to the next one. My father and a family friend decided to go snowmobiling at about 9 p.m. And as my uncle was up visiting us from Calgary, I asked if we could tag along on my smaller sled. We unloaded the sled and took off up Hadkin Mill Road to try to get to Nancy Green Lake. It started snowing quite heavily, and my father and his friends were just getting bogged down trying to break trail into the lake, probably 40 miles into the deep woods. We turned the sleds around to head back, and my dad said him and his friend were going to race back to the truck and for me and my uncle to just put back. I was about four miles down the fresh track when my uncle asked to drive. We switched spots, and he made it to the first corner and put the sled into a burn pile on the left side of the trail, getting us stuck. We were tramping a trail down in front of the sled, and we both started to smell something very strong, resembling rotten meat. And my uncle went into hysterics, crying and screaming, Bear! I, being a hunter since I was five, knew bears should be hibernating but that smell was making me scared too. I started the snowmobile and wriggled it back on the fresh trail to see what I thought was an old trapper run from behind the burn pile across the trail and through the brush, shaking all the snow off the trees as he went by. My uncle jumped on the sled and I went about 30 yards ahead where the creature ran and saw the large bare foot mark on the trail in front of me and the steps through probably four feet of powder snow. About ten or so miles down the trail, my dad was coming back to check on us, and upon stopping, he could see we were very shaken up, and I told him that there was a poor old trapper up the trail with no boots on. I explained where the incident occurred. I was not going back, and I went back to the truck. When my dad returned to the truck, he explained to me about the Sasquatch, 
and that it wasn't an old trapper in a fur coat that I witnessed. I remember the trapper only seemed about my dad's height at six feet and had a very long-haired fur coat covered with snow. I couldn't see much else for details because of the heavy snow and darkness. My dad seen the marks in the snow minus the clear one on the trail as I ran over it, but definitely said it was walking on two legs and they were quite long as there really wasn't any drag mark from where it walked through the deep snow. My uncle was three years older than myself, I was 12, and my father, who is now deceased, were witnesses. I have another personal experience in the same area about seven years later while deer hunting. It involved a large, same-smelling animal that did the scariest scream like yell all night above a cabin me and a couple of buddies were spending the night in. On to the next one. This was the craziest damn thing imaginable. If it hadn't happened to me personally, I wouldn't have believed it. I still live and hunt in Tennessee, but I haven't been back into this area that I'm about to tell you about since the day of this incident, and with good reason. Prior to September 14th of 2014, this was one of my all-time best hunting spots without exception. On this particular day, the forecast was for clouds and drizzle in the morning with skies clearing in the afternoon. I had hiked in about half a mile or so to a place where I always left a stand fixed in a tree. In fact, I had just replaced the stand because the old one that was there was getting rusty. That should tell you something in and of itself as to just how fond I was of this spot. This area was comprised of some of the thickest, most tightly packed forests that you will ever navigate. The bushes and trees in here, starting from the ground level and working their way up, were layered in height and density. If not for the occasional game trail, I don't believe that anyone in their right mind would attempt coming in here, but nobody ever said that I was in my right mind. I had made my way into the spot and was already comfortably sitting in the stand just at the break of dawn. My stand was fixed at a height of about 25 feet, with climbing pins turned into the tree all the way up to it. I'm going to do my best to describe to you exactly where I was sitting, and what it was that I could and could not see, as well as telling you why it was that I had chosen this area for my stand in the first place. This patch of forest was what I will call a depression within a depression. The surrounding area was a valley in between a pair of hills that were around 600 feet in elevation. There was an old and well-used game trail that ran just to the left of my stand and due north, which was directly in front of me when sitting in the stand. The vast majority of brush was between four and eight feet tall which one could by no means hunt in unless you could rise above it and look down on the trail. On most days, and as was the case on this morning, this bowl was filled with a damp, foggy mist that would eventually dissipate, but not until generally 9 a.m. or later. My sight range from the seat was about 75 feet and best in all directions, and then the trees and brush seemed to vanish in the mist. It is a very ethereal thing to sit here alone, and it has even spooked me on more than one occasion. As I was sitting in hopes of my prey coming down the trail at any moment, I began to hear what I will describe to you as being owls. There were little hoots and screeches coming in succession. It had started as one, and then progressed to the point where there were numerous screeches and hoots, all of which were coming from directly in front of me to my north. Being a hunter, it's virtually impossible for me to share with you in a few moments why I say what I'm about to tell you, but the fact of the matter is, and was, that these sounds were not real. In other words, to my trained ears, knowing what the area's owls sound like, how they make their calls, 
and what time of day they make their calls. I knew these were being faked. Simply put, something or someone was mimicking the owl calls. One of the most telling aspects was the amount of calls being made and the fact they were all in one area. The imagination can play some strange tricks on one's mind, especially when you are alone in the midst in such a location. I began to feel a sense of dread and a cold chill ran through my body, a shiver. At that moment in time, and for the first time since I had been coming in here, which must have been several dozen or more, I was wishing I had brought a gun instead of a bow. I had never felt this way before, as I just said. It was as though my psychological state was taking a terrible tumble out of control, and there was nothing I could do to control my thoughts and emotions. As if things couldn't get any worse, they did. There was so much hooting and screeching going on that it sounded like a darn war party was going on in the fog in front of me. The thought had crossed my mind to climb down out of the stand and make my way out, but that thought was countered by that of just staying put because I would be safer sitting off the ground. My heart was racing and sweat was actually dripping from my brow. I couldn't believe how frightened I was and it was escalating. What happened next was beyond belief. If you have never sat in or seen a folding tree stand, I was sitting on the seat portion, and my feet were resting on what I will call the floor of the stand. You can see through the entire stand and its components because it is more of a weave of steel as opposed to being solid plate, which is done to keep it as lightweight as possible. My back was against this tree, which was maybe 16 inches in diameter, and I was 25 feet off the ground, which means to say that my feet were about 20 feet off the ground. As I sat there, trembling, sweating, and, by the way, having seen nothing up until this point, I suddenly felt something grab the heel of my left boot. I immediately jumped to the point of almost falling out of the stand, and as I turned my head to look down to my left, I was staring into the grimacing face of a huge Sasquatch. He was looking directly up at me, having snuck up behind me, and was reaching with his left hand to grab hold of my boot. The very moment that I jumped, he let go and stood there, kind of swaying and watching me. As he stood there, the thought ran through my mind, that all the rest of the activity and noises were just a distraction which allowed this beast to walk up on me unaware. The thought of putting a broadhead right between his eyes was just one of the many thoughts that was racing through my mind. I expected at any moment that he was going to grab the foot tray and yank the stand out of the tree to devour me. The size of this thing was unbelievable, and I don't expect you or anyone else to believe me either. He was grabbing my heel with his hand 20 feet off the ground. You can do the math as to what type of size that equates into. It was just seconds after he had held my heel that he let go. The funny thing was that the grasp was not done with much, if any, pressure at all. It was as if it wanted me to know that it could do whatever it wanted, including sneaking up on me and touch me. He then turned and walked straight down the trail in front of me. As he did so, all of the noises had stopped. The wood had suddenly and unexpectedly become dead silent. I think he took about 10 steps to cover 75 feet and disappeared into the mist and trees. It was at that moment that I realized I was pissing in my pants. I have no idea why. Call it caused by trauma or whatever you want, but I was peeing in my pants. I leaned with my back against the tree for almost two hours in somewhat of a delirium, feeling as though I was on some type of hard narcotic, which had rendered me unable to think or act, and so I sat. I remember looking at my watch at 9.30 a.m. when I decided to move down the ladder. 
Everything for me at that moment in time was happening in slow motion. At least, that's the way I perceived it. It seemed as though it took 20 minutes to get down the ladder, after which I sat under the tree for another half hour or more. I was staring down the trail where the Bigfoot had walked away, and I have no idea why. I was in a complete and utter daze. I remember looking at my watch when I finally had reached the car, and it was almost noon, having begun my morning in the stand only a half a mile from where I had parked to begin my hike. It was as if, after this encounter and during it as well, that time had stood still. Yes, it was still passing, but I was totally and completely disconnected from reality. That week, I called out of work sick for eight days. It took me that long to recover from the stupor. I went back into the spot many months later, after winter had set in, and as I stood beneath the stand, I tried to make some sense of the events that happened that day. I looked up at the seat and visualized him reaching up and grabbing my boot. To do so, he would have to have been 14 or 15 feet tall, with his arms extended beyond that. His arm would have been 7 or 8 feet long. The game trail was only perhaps two and a half feet wide, and this beast, with its back to me, seemed to be at least three times the trail's width at its shoulders. It had long gray and white hair with dark gray skin that was visible on its face and hands as well as the upper chest as I looked down at it. Thinking back, the face seemed to have an incredibly evil smile. But is that how I was just perceiving him? Perhaps, as Bigfoot go, he was very handsome and was actually smiling at me. The fact is that he grabbed my boot very gently. He could have easily torn me and my chair from the tree, and that would have been the end of it for me, but he didn't. That's what left me so puzzled. When he was walking away from me, I felt as though anesthetic was taking effect before surgery. That moment in time when suddenly... You're drifting off, and then you can remember no more. However, I had taken nothing and had only the encounter to blame it on. It was the most bizarre event of my lifetime, and now you are part of it. On to the next one. A peculiar subset of Sasquatch behavior involves their interaction with orbs, sometimes carrying or handling them. At midnight on August 9, 1981, several witnesses camping in the Pamir Mountains region of Kyrgyzstan witnessed a hairy hominid walk silently beside their campsite and disappear into the night, as if it did not notice the camper. The creature held a glowing orb in its hands. Around 9.30 p.m. on September 27, 1973, two teenage girls witnessed a bipedal creature covered in white hair running toward a wooded area of Beaver, Pennsylvania. The creature was between 7 and 8 feet tall and carried a glowing orb in one hand. The pair ran to one witness's home and related the sighting to her father, who decided to follow the creature's path into the forest. As he entered the tree line, his daughter observed an object in the sky, which she believed was some type of aircraft. The object moved over the wooded area, projecting some type of beam down into the tree. The girl said her father stayed in the woods for over an hour. When an investigator interviewed him after the incident, the father denied ever entering the forest that night. He then declared there are some things that shouldn't be discussed and denied the investigator access to the wooded area. He stated he did not want anyone tramping around in his wood and he refused to discuss his missing hour of time in the forest. The father later began espousing end-of-time prophecies, predicting that the world would end in six months' time. East Texas witness Jeremy noticed other anomalous lights in the area of his Bigfoot encounters. 
I, almost every time, if not every time, witnessed the light phenomenon, the balls of light when I'm having Bigfoot activity. If I'm doubting they're around, if I start seeing the balls of light in the sky, it's like I know they are around and I'll start having activity. Or if I'm having activity, what I think is activity, then I'll start seeing light from the sky or I'll see weird light in the woods or above the tree. These are larger orbs and they kind of float around a while and they kind of float around while I'm having the Bigfoot activity. This is just my experience, but I'm almost convinced with as many experiences I've had, encounters with this phenomenon, there's some kind of correlation between the light and these creatures. This has happened numerous times. From my experience, there's a lot more to these creatures that is on the strange side that can't be explained. In my opinion, they are not just flesh, and blood. Even when not seen in conjunction with Bigfoot, orbs or will-o'-the-wisp lights appear with great frequency in areas thought to be Bigfoot hotspots or researchers seeking Bigfoot. On an episode of the Finding Bigfoot television program, James Bobo Fay and Renee Holland observed two orbs floating through the woods in southern Oregon while searching for Bigfoot. I can tell you this, Faye said, whatever we saw was not a person with a headlamp. It wasn't a car. It was much closer than we thought. It was smaller and not very bright, Holland continued, regarding to the orb. It just creeped me out. It's weird. In her book, Backyard Bigfoot, Lisa Scheel records a laundry list of strange phenomena associated with ongoing Bigfoot activity on her property. Game cameras placed around her horse farm snapped pictures of orbs with regularity. She wrote, The camera keeps filling its memory card with snapshots of orbs, orbs and more orbs. While cameras often represent dust particles as luminous balls, on another occasion, Shell witnessed an orb with her own two eyes. On the night of June 5th, 2005, I was awakened by a flash outside the bedroom window. The light flashed so bright it penetrated the veil of my eyelid. I glanced out the window at the front yard where the flash had seemed to originate. A line of 30-foot theater trees standing about 20 feet from the deck screened the house from the driveway. In front of the trees, an orb pulled. The light was bluish-white, with a brighter white rim. The orb glowed for a few seconds, then extinguished. A moment later, another orb, or perhaps the same one, which had moved, pulsed for several seconds to the right of where the orb pulsed. I saw a swarm of fireflies flickering. I estimated the orb to be similar in size to a basketball, far larger than the fireflies flittering about nearby. Jimmy B., a man residing in Lewisbury, Pennsylvania, was visited by two Bigfoot in April of 2018. Jimmy saw the creatures when shining a spotlight across his property while looking for deer. The eight-foot-tall, hair-covered creature ducked behind the trees and peeked out at Jimmy, their eyes reflecting in the beam of his spotlight. Both before and after sightings of the creature, Jimmy photographed multiple orbs both inside and around his house. On to the next one. My brother and I were fishing in a farm lake and decided it was getting late so we started home. And I felt like something was watching us. I turned and saw something standing at the edge of the wood. It was big, black, and hairy and just stood there observing us. I told my brother at once to get down, and he also saw the creature and exclaimed, My God, what is that? We sat there in awe for about ten minutes observing it. We were pretty scared and puzzled about it. Suddenly, we jumped up and started running home. When we got home, we told our mother about it. It looked as if it was getting out of the tree and was leaning with its arm up against the tree. 
the witness was also involved in another encounter with what he believed was the same creature while he was frog gigging in the river bottom with four other friends. All of them were allegedly chased from their gigging hole by something large and heavy as it ran towards them through the wood. Luckily, they were able to make it to their vehicle and escape before the creature revealed itself. A woman experienced a late-night sighting of Bigfoot near the Uniontown boat dock on Dyke Road, Union County, in November 1996. The creature walked unhurriedly across the road in front of her vehicle and disappeared into the tree line which ran there along the Ohio River. She described it as around 10 feet tall with long arms and covered with long woolly hair. It was broad-shouldered, narrower at the waist, and had a gorilla-like head with no neck. Her husband and son, both commercial fishermen, had heard this creature many times as it splashed about in the shallow waters just off the shore of a large island in the river. In 1996, the witness's husband and son worked as commercial fishermen on the Ohio River. The witness would drop them off and then pick them up again at a point further down the river. On the night of the sighting, she was waiting in the parked truck with the headlights off. She said her son was mistaken about the creature walking in front of the headlights. Although the moon was not full, there was enough moonlight to make things fairly visible. The creature came out of the woods about 50 feet from the truck, crossed the road and a field, and entered the tree line along the river. At one point, it stopped briefly and looked around. She estimated it was over eight feet tall, stating it wouldn't have fit through a regular-sized door. The body was broadest across the shoulders and narrower in the waist area. The head was shaped like a gorilla's, with no real neck visible. The witness described the creature as woolly-looking. While the witness could not see any facial details, she could see it had hair all the way down its arm and on its body and that it did not have any clothes on. According to the witness, it walked at an unhurried pace, swinging its arms just like a gorilla or a monkey would do. She said its arms were long compared to a human and probably hung down to knee level. After the sighting, the witness rolled up the windows, locked the doors, and turned on the headlights because she was frightened. No vocalizations or odors were associated with the sighting, the witness's son added that he and his father heard the log breaking noise on the island on four or five different occasions. The area has a long history of monster activity. Interestingly, it is also the site of the largest concentration of desecrated Native American burial mounds in the world and the largest known burial site in Kentucky. Over 800 graves belong to the Angel Medina culture were desecrated and looted at this location in the late 1980s. The crime garnered national attention and consequently massive protests from Native Americans across the U.S. Hundreds of representatives soon descended en masse on the area to hold rituals and sing sacred chants as they reinterred their ancestors back into what they considered sacred land. In the late 1990s, I was able to gain access into the area, known locally as the Slack Farm, and have a look around this magical place. Some stealth was required, since the grave desecration of the previous decade, which resulted in the nation's first lengthy prison term for Indian grave looters, the area was highly restricted, and trespassers were promised immediate jail terms as well. This was not the first time, nor the last, that I would find myself risking much just to stand on one piece of ground for a little while. Nonetheless, my wife and I were able to spend several quiet, uninterrupted hours there, completely unnoticed, as we walked to the far end of the ridge which sat below a very large forested hill. This hill, like so many others in the Commonwealth, was reputedly home to a large, hairy, man-like animal known locally as gorillas. As we walked close to a small creek at the base of the hill, we unexpectedly came upon the carcass of around 10 dead hogs. They were ripped to pieces and strewn over the entire lower end of the ridge. They appeared to be fresh, despite the curious absence of blood, 
and none of the meat looked as if it had been eaten. After an extremely uncomfortable feeling came over the both of us, almost like we were being watched, and we decided it would be best to leave. I have no doubt at all that Sasquatch exists in the area. The Higgins and Henry Wildlife Management Area, located in Morganfield, Kentucky, has also been the scene of several Bigfoot sightings in recent years. As of 2015, a camper who had become stranded at Daisy May Lake for several days repeatedly observed a large, hairy, human-like form prowling around in the woods outside his tent. A similar creature, if not the same one, was seen several years previously at the same location. As a matter of fact and public record, the Bluegrass State claims no less than three of the nation's most highly publicized and thoroughly investigated cases of alleged extraterrestrial attacks, one of which ended with the death of a highly decorated and well-respected citizen of the Commonwealth. While the UFO phenomenon is by no means the only airborne mystery to be experienced here, three-quarters of the unexplained aerial activities reported in Kentucky can be attributed to this single phenomenon. And it's a mystery that doesn't seem to want to go away anytime soon. Most people living in today's modern society are free to admit without much worry that they have seen something in the sky which they cannot explain. According to a Fox News broadcast on February 3rd, 2007, 40 million Americans claim to have seen UFOs. It has become the in thing in many social circles. But it was not always so. Years ago, those who came forward to admit UFO experiences were ridiculed, ostracized by their communities, and labeled mentally unstable. They often lost their jobs, families, property, and all public respect because of what they claimed to have seen or experienced. This is largely in direct contrast with today's public view. Some polls have suggested that as many as two-thirds of Americans now believe in at least the possibility of life on other planets, and it has become almost commonplace to see something unusual in the sky. This does not mean, however, that all UFOs are extraterrestrial vehicles originating from outer space. Many explanations can be and have been used in attempts to rationally explain the UFO mystery. Lenticular clouds, ball lightning, weather balloons, unrecognized terrestrial crafts, the planet Venus, one or all of these subjects could conceivably, under the right conditions, be mistaken for something of a more unusual nature. However, the first thing to become strikingly apparent to any would-be UFO researcher is the overwhelming amount of data and evidence accumulated in support of the reality of flying saucers. Literally, tens of thousands of reports of sightings and encounters with aliens of some type are available for consideration. Thousands of allegedly authentic pictures and videos of unidentified aerial objects are viewed or studied each year. Hundreds of thousands of books, articles, websites, and films are dedicated to the wide dissemination of the alien life form hypothesis. This worldwide enigma is also prevalent in nearly every culture that it simply cannot be comfortably suggested that all the witnesses are either lying or mistaken in their conclusions. If even one of these witnesses' testimonies is correct and accurate, then it would be wise of people around the world to give some serious consideration of the possibilities this notion suggests. If even one person is telling the truth, then we are being visited by frighteningly powerful entities from somewhere else, somewhere far beyond our perceptions and powers of scrutiny. And contrary to most popular opinions, they may not have our well-being ultimately in mind as they go about their highly mysterious business. Late one winter night in 1971 in Reed, Kentucky, Henderson County, Mrs. R. closed the Christmas catalog she had been looking through with her oldest daughter, Deanna, and rose to exit the room. As she switched off the light, she noticed a strange red glow coming through the window from somewhere outside. She walked over and looked out. What she saw frightened her enough to awaken her husband and five other sleeping children and flee the location in terror, never to return. According to her, 
What she saw was a glowing red disc-shaped object as it slowly descended from the night sky and landed behind an old overgrown bar. An overwhelming feeling of fright had come over her as she watched. The family's dog, which usually barked and accosted any outside visitors to the property, were strangely silent. The incident took place on Collins Road at an isolated farmhouse which sat near the bank of the Green River, and I can personally attest to the fact that the event actually took place as stated by Mrs. R. Mrs. R. is my own mother, and I was among six children who were forced to beat a hasty retreat from that location that cold night I was five years old at the time. Over the course of the ensuing years, I've personally witnessed phenomena of this nature on numerous occasions and remain convinced that misidentification of natural phenomena or conventional aircraft cannot adequately account for all reports of this type. One night in 1985, two brothers, Charles and David Yi, and myself, all members of a popular local band, pulled into the driveway of 10820 Carlinsburg Road, also in Reed, to set up for our first practice session at that address. When we pulled to a stop in front of the garage and killed the engine and stereo, we heard a very loud noise coming from outside. We exited the vehicle and the sound, which, which resembled the roar of jet engines, became so deafening that we had to cover our ears with our hands. In the night sky above the house, we saw three good-sized points of light flying slowly in a triangle formation. As it neared the house, the formation stopped for a split second, then each light shot away in different directions and was gone in the blink of an eye. One to the north, one to the south, and one shot straight up. The night was clear with very little cloud cover and visibility was exceptional. I was somewhat taken aback by the experience, but the Gee brothers just shrugged. They have seen the same thing. They soon informed me. Only a couple months earlier as it flew over their house on 3rd Street. On that occasion, however, it had flown silently. In the mid-1990s, another group of friends in Henderson County watched in amazement as several bright round lights cavorted in the sky just outside their home on Posey Road. The strange spheres repeatedly darted in and out of a large cloud bank, as if they were playing a friendly game of cat and mouse. They were so concerned that they called the regional airport a few miles away in Geneva to ask what in the world was going on. The controllers didn't know, they claimed, as they could see nothing on the radar. The witness, a Mr. John Webb, kindly suggested that it might well be time to buy a new radar before terminating the conversation. Again, the validity and accuracy of this report is beyond question, as both my wife and myself were among the group who witnessed the aerial display. In western Kentucky, the UFO phenomenon has become almost a commonplace occurrence, so much so that it is seldom officially reported. Due to the sheer magnitude of this recurring enigma, it can be safely assumed that, for each sighting that is reported, hundreds, if not thousands more, never appear on any report or in any local newspaper. The National UFO Reporting Center, or NUFOR, lists some 428 known sightings from the state of Kentucky. I'm aware of no official investigations which have taken place in regard to any of these incidents. My last personal sighting of a UFO took place on Christmas Eve 2005 when myself and two friends, neither of whom had any interest nor even believed in the subject at hand, observed a large red light as it hung stationary in the sky for around 10 minutes. As we talked among ourselves, it simply vanished into thin air and was gone. No one in the group was able to explain exactly what it was that we saw, but we were all convinced that it was something out of the ordinary. In any event, these unidentified flying objects have been seen time and time again by witnesses of all walks of life in every part of the Bluegrass State. In 1869, three scientists from Shelbyville, Kentucky, Shelby County, made an amazing announcement. Professor Winlock, Alvin Clark Jr., and George W. Dean all insisted that they had observed and quite independently small, brilliant lights traveling in straight parallel lines across the surface of the moon during a lunar eclipse. The only human flights of that time were, of course, of the fanciful variety 
and no explanation could be given concerning the mysterious light's origin. One must reckon, however, that the odd of these three separate scholars all hallucinating the same thing at the exact same moment must be astronomical indeed. In the summer of 1927, in Wolf County, Kentucky, a mysterious airship was seen which reportedly resembled a replica of some huge flying fish, complete with tail and perfectly shaped fins extending out near the front and small, short ones near the rear of the craft. Though dirigibles were well in existence at the time, no flights were known to be taking place in that area on that day, and, as of yet, no one has stepped forward to claim responsibility. September 7, 1959 a mail carrier in Wallingford, Kentucky, Fleming County, reportedly observed a bluish disc-shaped object at ground level. While the witness looked on it, it suddenly flew away on a horizontal trajectory, leaving behind a stained ring on the ground. No plausible explanations were forthcoming. April 23, 1997, multiple witnesses observe a shiny triangular-shaped craft with a light at each point and a larger light emitting from a hole in the bottom as it hovered above them in Williamstown, Kentucky, Grant County. It was perfectly noiseless, they claimed, and it shot red beams of light straight up into the sky before it finally sped off at great speed. A bit of high strangeness took place one evening around 10 p.m. in Rowan County, Moorhead, Kentucky, November 21, 2003, and was subsequently investigated by the UFO researcher Kenny Young. The episode started with a frantic call to 911. A resident of Skaggs Road told the local dispatch that he had heard what sounded like an adult female desperately screaming for help from a field located behind his house near Adams Lane. He felt sure that some type of dire struggle had taken place as the woman had yelled, Help me! Oh my God! Somebody help me! For nearly two minutes, followed by a long, terrified, non-verbal shriek. Strangely, a UFO was apparently witnessed by as many as five other people descending into the same field mere moments before the screams were heard. This was immediately followed by the strange craft's departure from the location in a westerly direction after it had rose from the field and hovered in the air for nearly a minute. One such witness, Dr. Virgil Davis, a University of Kentucky psychologist, informed investigators that the others had heard the screams as well, including his two sons, who claimed they sounded like the woman was being torn apart. He later informed members of the Moorhead Police Department that he and his sons had observed a strange ball of light, which he could not explain for at least 15 minutes just prior to the screaming sound. Within moments of the scene was crawling with police and rescue workers who found nothing to indicate that a life and death struggle had taken place in the area. A thermal imaging device was utilized in the search which lasted for nearly an hour and a half before being called off. The woman was never found. The area has a history of UFO activity. Moorhead, Kentucky is an estimated 45 miles south of Flemingsburg, Kentucky, where a crop formation appeared in a rye field in the spring of 2003. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!